Hey, hey, welcome back to The Notcast. It is Thursday, 18th of January, 2024, 355 or so, this one. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about Flaming Lips' 13th album. 13, can you believe it? Uh, released 11 years ago. The album is called The Terror. Uh, but the, not just, of course, The Terror released around about that time. Uh, the band also did, and, and get this in your ear holes, uh, Peace Sword and the Seven Skies H3 album as well, and uh, the Electric Worms record, and with a little help from my friends. And just to top it all off, um, uh, around about the same time that at last it's Christmas album. So actually that takes us to, if you count Peace Sword as an album, 15, 16, 17, about 18, 13 to 18 albums. And uh, that is a busy, busy period because all of these were released within 18 months of each other. So the Terror being released in April 2013, and at last it's Christmas. Uh, I think finally getting a release November 2014. So instead of mucking about with that, let's start off with the Terror. Um, in fact, we can't start off with the Terror because there's an album that came out before this, late 2012, that I probably should have done as part of my previous one when I was talking about the uh, the 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 collaboration album in late 2012 26th of october uh, the band released a limited edition record called playing hide and seek with the ghosts of dawn 500 copies uh sold at one gig and a note for note kind of recreation of an album by king crimson i think called in the hall of the crimson king i could be wrong but of course because i didn't go to that gig I don't own that album. It sold out very quickly. I did have a look to see how much would a copy of that cost? Well, about £300. And uh, no album is worth £300. And not only that, it's not a particularly good one. Because not only is it the Flaming Lips in their studio uh, recording the album, they've got a whole bunch of extra musicians and the bands that they're collaborating with largely asking about. And then you kind of go, what is the point of having an album? What's the point of an artistic statement about a record? What, what's, what's the, basically, dude, why bother making an album if nobody will ever hear it and it's not particularly good? I mean, it really does make me wonder. It absolutely does. Obviously, at this point, the whole concept of an album has kind of collapsed into itself. It doesn't really mean anything uh, because everything moved over to streaming, everything's doing up to uh, surprise drops of secret songs and, and all that type of stuff. And I, you kind of end up going, look, I'm old fashioned. I know that. You probably know that. Some of you have already made judgment calls about whether I've got ADHD or not just from watching these. So that's pretty cool too. But from my perspective, uh, an album is one of the most perfect art forms in the history of mankind. You know, the idea of, of about 50-ish minutes on one or two vinyl discs, a collection of songs designed together to work in conjunction with everybody else and create this, this cohesive whole that will tell a story where the songs work well with each other. They take you on an emotional journey, a narrative journey, a musical journey. And to then put those together, instead of watching, you know, individual three minute action scenes and car chases and going, yeah, that's very good, but what does it mean? An album creates the, 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 the idea of these things kind of sitting together and forming a bigger, wider story that's not just the story of the song, but in fact, the whole history of everything and what's going on. If you are in, uh, let's say, being black uh, and someone goes, well, what's the album about? You might go, well, it's, um, you know, the about 40 minutes or you might go it's the next 12 songs that we wrote that's why it's an album flaming lips it's a little different i get the impression certainly around about this time that is that they just recorded a lot of material whenever they felt like it and then put it together and went could we get an album out of this how would that feel what would that be like you know and releasing uh, effectively about seven albums in 18 months is a very very busy period kind of makes uh, King Gizzard, uh, and is it the Blizzard Wizard, I think it's called, um, feel like underachievers, uh, although I think they put out an album every day. No, Buckethead put out an album every day for a year. I think he did something like 320 albums in one particular year. I'm not sure even Buckethead heard all of those. So at this point, with being in a band that's so prolific, you have two ways of releasing the music. One, you just put loads of streaming stuff out, or 
two, as as they used to do. Um, you put an album with your twelve best songs on, and then you put all your other forty other songs onto various formats of CD, DVD, twelve inch, seven inch singles, and download only exclusives. Uh, Flaming Lips took a slightly different approach. Everything went on an album. No B sides anymore. Everything went on an album in some form or another, and it all kind of formed this this huge slew, this this almost constant stream of music. And the trade off for that uh, with a band that's fiercely prolific, and by the way, uh, they're definitely not prolific these days compared to that, but with a band that's that prolific is that the trade off is you have a weird and unrestrained approach. Because you end up kind of going, oh, you're doing this now, or what's the point of releasing that? Uh, so let's let's go through what they released through that period and then, then kind of get into a little bit more detail. We have The Terror here, released on the 1st of April 2013. Uh, this is, I think, a double LP. Uh, there's also uh, a single that was bundled in with some versions of the album, uh, The Sun Blows Up Today. Uh, so that's actually one, one of the last singles. Was. They then followed up with uh, an EP on the 29th of October, The Peace Sword. EP, which is here, uh, which is six songs, 29 minutes, that was recorded at the time for the soundtrack to a film called Ender's Game. Um, we also had on the 29th of October, Paranoia and Peace, uh, a split EP with Tame Impala, which was sold at the Halloween shows, and there were 2,000 copies of that. I don't own it, because oddly enough, really bloody expensive. On the 29th of November, a, a month later, the uh, fourth major release of the year was the time has come to shoot you down what a sound that is the vinyl only record store only uh, black friday um, us only cover version of the stone roses debut lp as performed by the flaming lips and their heady friends in a performing studio the flaming lips themselves only play on one song on the lp they just produce the rest of it and then you kind of go what is what's the point of a flaming lips lp if you only play on one song and you happen to produce it. How does that make, I don't know, Iggy Pop's The Idiot not a David Bowie record? How does that make Liza Minnelli's results not a Pet Shop Boys album? Um, and that's the, you know, the fourth major release, three of which all came out within a month. April 2014 saw Seven Skies H3. At least I think that's what it's called. And Seven Skies, as I've mentioned in the previous episode, is a compilation and remix of the 24-hour song Skull. By the way, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's three more to come, or two more to come, I think. No, three more. So on the uh, 18th of August 2014, we had the Electric Worms LP. I'll get to that in more detail. Let's follow that up with something else. Ah, 27th of October, the Flaming Lips with a little help from my friends. A note-for-note -note cover of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And then the last one, Imagine Peace by At Last Eats Christmas, uh, which pretends that it's not, but it actually is the Flaming Lips under a secret name. And then you kind of go, what is the point of, of being in a band? And what is the point of, of going, well, actually, this is an album? Because the whole concept of an album, an album used to be an event. It used to be something that you'd, you'd look forward to and you'd listen to and then you'd suddenly go, right, that's the music that I'm going to be listening to from this band for the next few years. Let's get really, really deep into it. Let's absorb it into our bloodstreams, take it into our psyches, know that songs, knows, knows those songs and those albums inside out, explore every permutation of what it could be. Yeah, at this point, if you're in the Flaming Lips, well, if you didn't like this album, there's another two coming next month, so it doesn't really matter. It sounds bitchier than it's meant to be. Um, since I haven't got playing hide and seek with the Ghosts of Dawn, I'm not going to talk about it, and I have no interest in uh, King Crimson anyway. Instead, let's go straight to The Terror, uh, which I think is, is actually it's a really, really good LP. Um, like a lot of, of uh, Flaming Lips LPs and music, um, the band have had their moment at this point, though sometimes bands kind of carry on in their own sweet path and they do the thing that they want to do, whatever that is. And if you're a really lucky band, most bands aren't, but if you're a really lucky band, at some point, the searchlights of culture, you know, like the searchlights outside a prison camp, land upon you for a period of time before culture and the world moves off in a slightly different direction and you go in a slightly different direction. Some bands stay at that point 
for 20, 30 years. You 2 have done it, Metallica have done it, Guns N' Roses clearly didn't. Um, and, you know, the world goes in one direction and then you as a band go in another direction. And that's what happened to the Flaming Lips. So this is 10 years after Yoshimi battles the Pink Robots. It's seven or eight years after At War with the Mystics. Um, the world had gone in a very different direction. Uh, and 2013, I mean, at that point, I was 40 when this came out. I don't really know what was popular in 2013. And I spent a whole year there. Uh, now, I know that sounds like Grandpa Simpson, but I had stuff going on. Lots of people have stuff going on. And, you know, finding out what's, what's latest on the Pitchfork hit list of up-and-coming bands is, is not, was not necessarily number one on my, my list of stuff in my brain at that point in time. At that point in time in my brain, I was dealing with, effectively, a confluence of events uh, that made my the year I turned 40 really, really difficult. Uh, lots of people have these years. I don't expect I'm in any way different from the vast majority of people. But, you know, I didn't get a sports gear. Uh, I, didn't, you know, I didn't get covered in tattoos. And I didn't get, uh, you know, I, I didn't end up kind of trading my house in for a motorbike. So it, it wasn't a bad year, but it was a tough one. We had health issues and, and, and uh, job issues and things like that. And, you know, that stuff happens. And some years are good and some years are bad. And 2013 was a, a bad year for me um, and it, it was you know one of my least favorite years really the terror was an album that absolutely hit me in the right place at the right time when it came out um, there's a, a quote from from wayne in the bella union press release that says without love we would disappear if we have given love and known love and have love then we are alive and without love there is no life and the terror is that sense of without love or, or, or that fear that without love, life goes on. And I'd been in that position in my life is where I thought my life had been going in one direction and it had uh, meaning and narrative and purpose and a conclusion and everything I was doing was working towards achieving and maintaining that position. I had had a period in my life when all the things that I took for granted, you know, relationships, jobs, uh, trust, honesty, all those type of things, just got destroyed uh, in a very, very short period of time, uh, worst year of my life. And I was like, all the things that I thought I, I could um, build my life around as a foundation were suddenly taken away from me. And if you don't have the foundations and you haven't finished building the property, the property can collapse. And that's exactly what happened to my life at that point. So the terror to me as an album really resonated with uh, the trauma which I'd experienced many, many years previously. Um, the trauma about thinking that life was going to be a certain thing and then suddenly realising that that narrative doesn't necessarily exist, that the sense that you apply to the life that you have doesn't necessarily exist, the meaning that we give to life through things like love and cats weren't necessarily taken for granted. They were still... See, the trade-off was, yeah, I'll do the washing up, I'll go to work uh, and for that I'll get paid and then when I get paid that allows me to have the life that I want to have when I'm not working. And then you thought, well, actually, the life that I want to have is, is a life that's very, very far from the life that I'm actually living. And so for me, the whole of the terror, and the terror was a phrase that really kind of spoke to me, was that the year this came out was a really bad year for my mental health. Um, there was a, uh, a way of, 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 of looking at life, and I, was, I had anxiety, terror, trauma, um, you know, depression, all those things. And I, I was thinking about facing up to, well, well, how bad could things really be? What could really go wrong? And, you know, having already, to, to quote the boxer, you know, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you stand up. Having been knocked down a number of times and having stand, stood up again a number of times after that, by 2013, I was like, I'm tired of fighting, guys. Can we just stop this? You know, and the cliche or the statement from Kubrick is that the universe itself is neither fair nor unfair. The thing that is truly terrifying is that events just kind of roll forward. And I forgot what that quote is. Uh, and I should know it off by heart. But that's the true terror is knowing that, you know, the random meaninglessness of, of existence and life. And, and, you know, one day you might be a human and then the next day you might be Steve Irwin and, and killed to death by, uh, you know, a, a venomous stinger from a, you know, a, barbed fish thing whatever it was that killed him 
you know, or the idea of. And one thing that I, I do not want to have happen is you think kind of like, right, so I've been killed by a bear. And I'm like, the bear doesn't even understand poetry. Why, how could it have this power over me? And that's part of the terror is, you know, the people that could, um, and, and this is a thing with anxiety and depression, is if you have those that live in your head free and, you know, you get them, you know, it's like, congratulations, you've got, uh, you know, anxiety and worry. It's like, thanks, didn't want it, but I've got it. Great, brilliant. It's like having a bonus track at the end of the CD and then most of your psyche suddenly being taken up by a 20-minute noise jam called Endless Nameless at the end of Nirvana's Nevermind. That's the kind of stuff that sits there and you need to kind of cut that stuff out and get through and go, well, this is who I am and what, what I think and how I feel. And, and life sometimes is about editing things and it's cutting away the stuff that doesn't look like you and to, um, until you get something that looks like you and the life that you want to live. The terror was very, very real for me at that point. I was kind of going, right, so is this it? Is this all there is? Is it going to be just working and commuting and, and going into London? And is it going to be like illness and death and boldness and all that stuff that happens? And then my life got much, much better, actually. Uh, and, and I kind of saw through that and I kind of, you know, a, a door opened and a light shone through it. And I was kind of like, I, I think I can see the path through and I've got to go through that in order to that. Obviously, the cliche about when you're going through hell, keep going. But uh, for me, The Terror was an album that I really, really listened a lot to in 2013 and 2014. Um, there was a, an idea that the music was about anxiety and worry and loneliness, and it was around um, cold beauty like a glacier. Or when you think about, you know, space is beautiful when you're inside the spaceship. It's terrifying and deadly if you're not. And the terror was about finding a way to, um, as the, the flaming lips said, eat your own spaceship, create my own spaceship, my own kind of support bubble around me and moving forward. And this record was really, really helpful for me in that, that process, because all the songs were about effectively going, I'm staring into the eyes of, of something that, that's uh, terrifying and powerful, and I'm staring back at it, and how you then face that approach. You know, um, there was a, some, some of the lyrics in the album are around the art of letting go of order. So for example, if you think about life itself being effectively mostly chaos, you know, the, the reason why, let's say, a car crashes into a bollard. Could be something as simple as a worn brake line lining. It could be something as powerful as a cardiac arrest while someone's driving or an epileptic fit. Sometimes there is no reason for it. When people go, oh, everything happens for a reason. That's bullshit. It doesn't. Most things don't happen for a reason at all. Most things happen not for a wider reason to give you meaning, but most things happen for a very boring reason, like rust, for example, or a broken charger cable. You know, these are all things that, that cause catastrophic events like the butterfly effect. Um, and I was, I was listening to a podcast today where they were talking about uh, Back to the Future 2. And in Back to the Future 2, Crispin Glover's character, you know, is a successful author uh, because he, he wrote a book about, you know, being saved by love from outer space. And then the conspiracy theory is when Marty McFly says, oh, I'm Darth Vader from the planet Vulcan, and then, you know, um, George McFly is kind of sat there and visited by aliens in 1955. And he suddenly thinks, these aliens are real because Gene Roddenberry has put Planet Vulcan into Star Trek. He's put Darth Vader, in, uh, or, you know, George Lucas has put Darth Vader into Star Wars. I was visited by the same aliens that visited George Lucas and Gene Roddenberry. And you kind of go, OK, that's a leap. But at the same point, not my idea, I think it's Tim from Sequelizers that did that, uh, you kind of sit there and go, sure, things happen for a reason. They might not be the reasons that you think they are at all. The Terror is an album that really, really stuck with me. Um, and it, it, it's in fact, it's 11, 11 songs, nine on the vinyl edition with the single, uh, 11 on the UK CD in two forms. Uh, but it's an album that's around letting go of the need to impose order upon what is effectively chaos. If you're not careful, you end up seeing patterns in things that don't exist. You see the difference between causation and correlation. So, for example, the rise of high seas piracy and the decline of the sale of VHS players. The two aren't related, guys. They're absolutely not. Don't look at them and make false equivalences here. The two aren't related. Uh, uh, but you have to let go of order and you have to go, sometimes stuff just happens um, and instead of, of uh, 
making an album, for example, and trying to impose an order upon that. The, the Flaming Lips in this period, I think they, they were just recording stuff and then forming from that what they thought felt best to release, if that makes sense. You know, four missed jams, they go, I'm going to have four bars out of there and 15 minutes out of there and two minutes out of there, much in the same way that Seven Skies H3 is formed from an effectively 24-hour song. The Terror is an album that's not melodic, it's not accessible, it's not easy, it's not warm, it's scared and it's frightened and it's got this haunted rhythmic horror movie soundtrack type approach to it effectively if john carpenter fronted a prog rock band that's what the terror would sound like i can't think of any higher uh, recommendation than that really but it's a, it's an album that that really to me kind of spoke to me about my anxieties and my fears and my terrors about growing older and insecurity and health and relevance and you know all those things uh, and effectively, am I going to turn into Grandpa Simpson or not? Let's go through the songs that are on the album, because what I've done is I've spent 20 minutes showing you the cover for the record, not going any air into the record. I often do this. You know, It starts with um, a, a track called uh, Look, the Sun is Rising. And probably the best way to do that is, rather than have you listen to it, is let's open the gatefold. So what we can see in the gatefold, by the way, slightly new lineup for the band, the new member in there, Derek Brown on uh, keyboards and guitar. Also Cliff Skirlock on drums. Uh, this is his last LP with the Flaming Lips. Uh, the, uh, his departure from the group was, uh, I think, somewhat acrimonious. Um, and I think it's fair to say that I completely understand his position uh, around what happened uh, and I respect his honesty around that. I also think, and this is a, a, maybe a, a thing that is, is important, is at this point, the Flaming Lips had effectively become a self-contained operation. So they were assigned to Bella, Bella Union in the UK, a uh, label owned by and run by, I think, Simon from the Cocteau Twins. Uh, they weren't necessarily on, on the Warner Brothers anymore. They had complete artistic dominion and control over what they did and how they did it. They weren't answerable necessarily to anybody and had found basically the sweet spot in terms of artistic and creative integrity is the ability to do what they wanted when they wanted how they wanted and if they wanted to put a 24-hour song into a usb stick and embed it into the back of a human skull and sell it for six thousand dollars and only sell 13 copies of it no record company was going to stop them they were going to do it and you know that's that's a, a really interesting approach but it also means if you're a flaming lips completist you are never going to be and you're never going to catch them all the you know the flaming lips are kind of like the pokemon and the pikachu of, uh, of experimental rock you can't get it all no matter how much you try there's only 13 people in the world that can have the complete collection and most of them i think don't have everything um, i'm definitely not one of them i don't know if i'd ever feel comfortable buying a human skull with a usb stick in it or without a usb stick in it i mean effectively though if, if you have a you know a slightly different band configuration and uh, a different set of um, structure around you you're then in the position where you can kind of say, I don't need to be answerable to anybody. If I want to do this and I'm my own boss, I can do it. And that's a, you know, a form of creative freedom. Um, there is a risk of being surrounded by yes men, uh, a risk of, and I've seen this with other bands. You know, there's a risk of, of being surrounded by people that say to you, every idea you have is absolute genius. And you do need somebody to push back sometimes. You do need um, a, a personality to kind of go back and say, this isn't a good idea. And sometimes you need to put boundaries and limitations onto things. Otherwise, uh, although necessity is the mother of invention, otherwise you end up in a situation where you don't have any barriers, you don't have any controls. And you can kind of like zoom off into your own universe and then suddenly you find out that you're a single lone spaceman thousands of miles away from any spaceship and uh, you're, you're lost in the darkness forever. Just like uh, Kia Dullier in uh, 2001. Well, that wasn't actually, it was Gary, wasn't it? Um, whatever his name is. Uh, the, uh, the other astronaut in 2001 who died alone in the cold of space. So when I was talking about building your own spaceship, is that you have to have your own spaceship to live in. You can't just kind of roam off and hope that you'll be okay. So yes, not even talked about one song yet, but we'll go with Look, The Sun Is Dying. And it's got a lyric about love is something you should fear. And I think that's a really important lyric in the context of the rest of the album. The rest of the album is about 
effectively love and relationships and the power of relationships and the, the way that they can be really powerful and dangerous even. You know, uh, t I know take that, Sang, be being in love is a big responsibility. And I, I know at the same point is that uh, Portishead sang, no one should be afraid of what they can't touch, see or feel. Or, sorry, what they can't, what they cannot touch or see. Um, but, you know, love is an incredibly powerful emotion. It's, it's absolutely, you know, life-changing and important. Makes a huge difference. It is the reason why the world goes round. And as per the B-side, if sun blows up today, love is all that you need. But also at the same point, it's it's a scary thing. It, it can be something that you should fear. John Betjeman said, uh, I mean, you know, being a man is like being shackled to an idiot as the owner of a penis. Not a phrase I ever thought I'd say on this podcast. Um, I, I, I have on occasions made suboptimal decisions uh, thanks to certain parts of my body uh, making or influencing those decisions. At the same point, and power is only dangerous when it's used irresponsibly and without care. So you can kind of go, actually, that's a really good point. Love is something that you should fear. Um, and uh, let's go into the LP because, again, I've shown you the great gatefold for a little while. So, again, abstract. I'm not quite sure what this is meant to be communicating, this image. And at this point as well, the Flaming Lips did a lot of, of uh, special editions, coloured vinyls, all those type of thing. I have a black vinyl version of the Terra, which might actually be rarer than any of the coloured vinyl versions. I'm not quite sure, uh, but there's, uh, you know, there's, there's that as part of it. So, uh, look, the sun is dying, has the lyric about love is always something that you should fear uh, when you really listen. Fear is all that you fear. And that's that's like one of the key tenements of the, of the Terror album. Is going, actually, fear is the thing which you fear itself. Is And remember, fear is not necessarily something that ever comes to pass. It's an abstract concept. It's a what if. And uh, you, you can fear the what if. Um, it may not ever happen. And, you know, certainly I, I've had voices in my head that have told me around what could happen and being prepared for that. And at the same point is, especially if you've got um, you know, PTSD or if you've got trauma experiences or you've got um, you know, any, any form of uh, bad experiences is that you end up being so alert to, pardon me, avoid those experiences is that you end up at the point where your nervous system, your detection mechanism is running frantically overdrive to identify and isolate and neutralize any potential form of negative impact upon you to the point where it's just it's just exhausting being alive you end up going everything i'm doing is focused on neutralizing potential issues and threats before they happen and that's part of what is so exhausting about having any form of ptsd is that there's coping mechanisms but also there's hyper vigilance towards things that could be happening which may only exist in your head. And, and that's part of one of the scary things about the terror itself. Track two on the album is called Be Free. And Be Free, I really like. It has um, an idea in it, um, uh, probably which I, I've seen articulated, um, and, which is, did God make pain so we can know the high that nothing is? I mean, that is pretty bleak as a lyric, isn't it, to start off with, in the same way that that fantastic uh, Star Trek episode from The Next Generation, the game, I'm not playing the game, by the way, so I've just mentioned the game, I'm not starting the game, okay? If you know what the game is, you can only lose, you can never win. If you don't know what the game is, don't Google it, and you're much better off. But in the Star Trek episode, the game, what they're talking about is the nature of addiction. And the idea being is that addiction actually transfers from being a pleasurable position to an absence of displeasure. And then you suddenly realize, actually, you're just down into maintenance and you've reached a kind of basic state of reality where there is no high anymore. And, and then that's where they look to God make pain to make you know uh, the, the high that nothing is. And the idea that actually the absence of pain is, is really quite nice um, but then at the same point that's a very pessimistic outlook to have and that's where the terror comes from is this concept of fear and pain and having things taken away from you although i do feel when i mentioned star trek is that i should mention was it star trek 5 where the guy starts talking about pain or is it spock who cares doesn't matter not a good film star trek 5 obviously the uh 
even numbered ones are the best ones and the odd numbers ones are the worst because all the cliches are true track three on the album sorry for the star trek uh, death position there is uh try to explain and try to explain is about what happens when a relationship comes to an end and hopefully you have never been there but i suspect you have and the idea is going is uh, there's a lyric about and I'm really very, very clear about it here is uh, try to explain why you've changed. Try to explain why you're leaving. I don't think I understand. I think we've all been there. I wish we hadn't, but we have. The idea of, of processing the end of a situation and going, why is this happening? And you kind of go, ah, right. So, And then sometimes people will go, well, it's because of this or it's because of that. You kind of go, I don't think that's a good enough reason to do this. I don't, uh, but yeah, obviously the reasons are valid and fair to them as individuals, and you have to respect that. It doesn't mean you have to like it. You can't change it. You know, uh, relationships are not prisons, despite how some of them might feel. Um, moving over to side two, and side two has uh, a tr the tracks "You Lust" and "The Terror." The Terror is, I think, the absolutely pivotal track on this LP, and it occupies exactly the middle point on the nine track album. Uh, and and, and the, 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 the lyric around that is, you know, life is just stuff happening. What is the meaning? What is the point of, of all of that? You know, the, the idea of, of going um, in that lyric is, uh, and he kind of sings about, at least we'll sing of the terror. Uh, the terrors are in our heads. We don't control the controls. Um, and it kind of go, yeah, man, that is a that is very true because the terror sometimes fear is it, it's not real. It's you know it, it's it's uh, you know imaginary demons. It's uh, impossible consequences. It is also, of course, the thing that could happen that may not ever happen that you don't know about, and it's it's kind of really really scary. And that was a the terror and anxiety around uncertainty when parts of my life were threatened in twenty thirteen were things that I was obsessed with. I thought I'd spent all my life working towards creating something that was okay, it's pretty good. And then people, external actors, were seeking to dismantle all of my achievements over the, the previous 22 years since I became an adult, threatening everything. And I kind of go, what's it all for? Um, as you might know, the, uh, the, the, the wonderful fly tipping by Suede as, as the lyric around what has it all been for? And that was kind of where I was at that point. As I was kind of going, what is this? Oh, pardon me. Sorry, I didn't mean to fall over there. I'm going to have to re-clip myself on. I feel like uh, Ron Burgundy there. Um, you stay classy, not casters. Um, the idea that you kind of go, well, if, if everything I've worked for has been dismantled, what is the point of it? Now, the cliche is, or more correctly, the statement is, all political careers end in failure. Everything ends in failure. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is forever. Sometimes a period of time that something exists is enough. It doesn't have to last any longer than that. It just has some things have a set lifespan. A relationship could last 10 years. It could last 10 hours. That is the lifespan of that. And you end up kind of going, not everything has to be forever. You know, you can't just pick and choose the things that you love as just having glass forever. You know, everyone goes to the dentist. And whenever anybody goes to the dentist, they also know, this isn't going to last forever being in the dentist, which is good because it's not very nice. Uh, but at the same point, you kind of go that moment where the door is shut and there's the two people and we're in the room together and we're talking and, and there's a communication between two souls. You want that to last forever because that's nice. You don't want the bit where you, you know, you're having a filling to last forever. Not everything lasts forever. That's not an achievable or realistic aspiration to have. Sometimes it's good enough to know we had something for a period of time. And obviously life is a diamond in some respects as well. It gets better, then it gets worse, then it gets better again. And then at some point, everything that you've achieved starts to slowly unravel as you get older. And eventually, obviously, we, uh, we face the long, cold sleep of death, uh, as he said cheerily. That could be part of the accidental terror that sits inside the album that defines behaviours. And this is why this album is really, really important to me because it talks about all these things. There isn't an album that I think has really ever encapsulated or articulated the sheer enormity of things like anxiety and depression and all that stuff. Yeah, there's Pink Floyd's The Wall, but that's not, not as good as this. Yes, I said it. 
Right, track six, side C. You are not alone. Or more correctly, it's called, uh, let me just quickly check, you are alone. Sorry. So even though there's a lyric earlier on about um, even though you're not alone, it does actually, you are alone. You know, uh, ghost driving meat skeletons on a ball of rock orbiting a giant fire. Hooray! Cheerful, cheerful, cheerful. Um, and then, of course, track seven uh, is Butterfly, How Long It Takes to Die. That is not a new song. Uh, it first appeared on the Strobo Trip USB stick in 2011. Uh, it appears in a more cohesive form as a separate song remixed uh, for the terror so nothing is truly wasted it's only ever uh, kind of like you know repurposed later on in the same way that that idiot that made the film world west with uh what's his name uh, will smith desperately wanted to have a giant mechanical spider in every film that he made around about that time and really wanted to get the giant mechanical spider into nicholas cage's superman lives um, and when he couldn't get into that he got into the stupid cowboy film uh, you know, ideas are reproduced. They're, they're, um, they're, they're, if they're not, you know, fully utilised, they will appear again in slightly different forms. That's right. All right, track eight is turning violent. And uh, track nine is always there in our hearts, which um, appears, uh, or more correctly, is picked up later in the Peace Saw DP, the same kind of thing. So the two lyrics that we have in those two songs are kind of addressing... Um, Violence, death, control, mortality, and the end of things. So turning violence is, is around, you know, the, the way that people fight against the inevitable, the way that people kind of focus towards, I want to have dignity and control around situations and they can't necessarily achieve that. And uh, always there in our hearts has this lyric about, always there in our hearts is a fear of violence and death. There is evil that wants out, that sorrow there are sorrows and sadness, and there's something pure that we can't control. It's pretty bleak. Um, it's, uh, it's an album that's a, very, very clearly to me about the terror, the terror of life, the terror of, of things and the fear of the future and what may happen within it. And it's bloody brilliant LP. I absolutely love it. It is not easy listening in case you haven't worked out at all, but I really love it. Vinyl editions of the album contain an exclusive track, a album length remix of every song on the LP called We Don't Control The Controls, which is 15 minutes long, not on the other editions of the album, but a vinyl only exclusive remix. Really good though, really good. Uh, really enjoy it and it kind of reprises all of the other things. Vinyl editions also feature, or at least some of them, this exclusive seven inch single, uh, Sun Blows Up Today, backed with a cover of uh, the Beatles and All You Need Is Love. And um, that's uh, a lovely, cheery, funny, fun song, actually, surprisingly light and cheerful. And it's just a lovely bit of perfect sun-drenched pop. Um, vinyl editions also come with CD of the album there. And the CD itself comes in a slightly different format. Here is the Terror on the UK CD. So the nine songs Plus, as it says here, a sun blows up today, mini CDs. There aren't many mini CDs made in what a three inch CD single. So you've got your standard album there, and you've got your booklet and all the other stuff that goes in. And then inside the, on the, on whatever the word is for that, uh, I forgot the word there, you've got a three inch CD, effectively a mini CD single of sun blows up today, and all you need is love. I really, really recommend this album. I hope you love it. If you don't know it and you like The Flaming Lips, give it a listen. It's not, it's not the bright, cheerful, euphoric stuff. It is more the kind of the flip side of that, darker, more anxious, more worried, more, more like a horror movie soundtrack played by the Beach Boys when they're tripping on a beach. It's probably the best way to describe it. Maybe... If The Flaming Lips did a soundtrack to any film, it would have been the Monkeys movie, Head, which is not very good, I think, uh, but I don't really know a huge amount about it. This album is really, really good. It was followed up very, very quickly, uh, less than, well, six months later, with the Peace Sword EP, uh, which was only released on vinyl at the time with a shrink-wrapped, or more correctly, a CD 
inside it as well. And Peace Sword is a 29 minute EP, effectively a compilation of, of B-sides and extra tracks from, the, from roughly the same period. These songs were designed to be on the soundtrack to the film Ender's Game with Harrison Ford. I've seen it, it is dog shit. Um, but it's uh, six songs which pick up some of the same themes that take a slightly more optimistic kind of relationship as opposed to the uh, the, uh, the the terror itself. Uh, Peace Sword, the title track, is called um, has the subtitle of Open Your Heart, and it kind of is the, the flip side, the answer, the call and response to uh, Always In Our Hearts. Well, Always In Our Hearts is about death and destruction and the end of everything and, and terror and fear. Um, and Peace Sword is, is kind of around uh, ignoring pain, opening your heart to light and to joy. Um, open your heart to me is the, uh, the the lyric, which sounds very very Madonna actually, um, and then it follows up with the track "If They Move, Shoot Them." Great name for a song. Any song that's "If They Move, Kill Them," "If They Move, Shoot Them" generally is pretty good. Um, but, uh, again, it's a more optimistic song than perhaps some of the other ones which you might expect. There's a, a soft ballad called "Is the Black at the End Good." <laughs> maybe about the uh, the film actually when everything fades to black and here come the credits unless of course it's a Hal Needham film or a Jackie Chan movie where you get to see the outtakes when they all goof off and you think making this movie was probably more fun than watching the movie uh, and then there's Think Like a Machine Not a Boy uh, Wolf Child and then Assassin Beetle The Dream is Ending which is a this this lovely weird experimental out there 10 minute instrumental uh, which is, also has a subtitle of, of Wolf Child Part 2. That's 35 minutes, effectively, although it's not officially one, effectively the 14th Flaming Lips studio album, even though it's only six songs. You can't really understand the terror without also knowing Peace Sword, because they're two sides of the same coin, and uh, effectively, you know, two pages in the, in the very, very same book there. Right. <sighs> Big breath feels like a monologue. I feel like I should be James Bond, and, or more correctly, Blofeld, and telling you my evil plan to take over the world. I don't have an evil plan. I'm not evil, nor am I that organized. Um, April 2014, as previously mentioned, saw the release of the 15th-ish studio record, Seven Skies H3, which I touched upon in the previous episode. This is a remixed edit of condensed highlights and major themes from the 24-hour song skull. It came out on CD, which for some reason, because I had an auto download, uh, I never opened. Maybe I should keep that. And a uh, vinyl edition. Yeah, uh, this was, and uh, let me just quickly check, I think this is clear vinyl. Uh, I think this might have only been released on clear vinyl, actually. I give this one a spin every summer. One of the things I love to do in the summers. I like to sit out in the garden under a sunshade with a cold drink, a nice book and some vinyl and listen to the records uh, whilst the cats sleep in the sun and the neighbours do the mowing. Um, so this album was recorded uh, 2011 in a one month burst as a 24 hour song uh, and then then it was kind of remixed, edited, condensed, stuck back together and represented as an album in itself. Uh, don't think it's a a flippant album or a joke album. There we go again, falling down. Oops, having a bad day with the clip. Where's it gone? Oh, there you are. Proves that these things are live. See, if I was editing, I would have taken that bit out, but I'm not. So this is what happens to go further and nearer. Yeah, um, so Seven Skies H3 is, I think it's a, a really great album, actually. Really interesting, effectively a 50 minute song and I really love the way that it changes and melds. It's got the same kind of cohesiveness and the way that it moves from one song to another as Dark Side of the Moon, but it's a very different beast, of course. And then we had on the 18th of August, 2014, we had an album by Electric Worms. Who are Electric Worms? Well, this is called Music de Schur zu Twerk, which effectively is music you can't twerk to in German. And uh, this features Wayne and Stephen Droz from The Flaming Lips, uh, had a, a limited release 
it had a, a perhaps a more widespread CD version here, uh, but it also had a, a limited vinyl release with um, a CD, again, shrink wrap to it. And this I think is on lilac vinyl, uh, really kind of touching into the, the kind of the dark pink neon and uh, all these colors, kind of trying to, to touch back to or give you a feel for that kind of 80s Tron synth wave kind of approach that you would see uh, in terms of cover and imagery, but also it's a psychedelic freak out. It is uh, Wayne and Stephen with, I think a band called, is it Linear Vessel or something? I'm not quite sure actually. I probably should check, uh, but I don't quite know. And um, it is, uh, let me just quickly check, produced by the Flaming Lips. So it effectively replacing Michael Ivins and Derek Brown with a whole new band just to see what it would be like. This is, again, the flip side to the terror and peace sort. Uh, the best way to describe it really is it's a whole bunch of extra songs. It sounds just like the Flaming Lips, but it doesn't sound like the Flaming Lips at the same time. Uh, Droz takes a, a far more um, prominent role in the vocals than Wayne, and it is a really interesting, curious LP. It is, as Q would have said, not for the faint of heart. But if you love the Flaming Lips, it's really worth listening to. It's got a lot of rewarding elements that sit within it. Um, and uh, you know, as I said, uh, you know, if you don't want to pay for the LP, you can always find the CD. Uh, and uh, it's only 29 minutes long. So although it calls itself a modern prog rock masterwork, that's quite modest, uh, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's pretty good. It's not amazing. It's not essential. Definitely worth hearing. And of course, then there were uh, two more releases in 2014. We had, once again, one of the note for note cover versions. This time, instead of uh, putting everything into a limited edition record store day, Black Friday, 500 only copies, bullshit release that costs 300 pounds if you want to look at it on Discogs, this is perhaps a little bit more like it. Uh, this is a, a cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the album by a band called The Beatles, which you may or may not have heard of. I suspect you have. and. I, I really like this. It's in no way fantastic or even vastly interesting. It is, however, curious. It's a nice way to spend 45 minutes uh, listening to the Flaming Lips going totally bonkers with arrangements and instrumentation without having to think about, oh, we have to write songs. And it's like, well, we don't have to write songs, do we? We can just cover Beatles songs and see how that goes. Uh, and just have fun and futz about in the studio and make weird and unusual noises. So that's exactly uh, what With A Little Help From My Friends is. I really like this album. Uh, you know, it's got guest appearances by lots of people. Uh, My Morning Jacket, some of whom later worked with Roger Waters. Uh, you know, The Flaming Lips, Miley Cyrus, of course. The Electric Worms make an appearance. Um, Moby is on here. I think Henry Rollins is on here as well. Um, and basically loads of people turn up on this record and it's, it's a fun entertaining listen if you just want to listen to it and go well that's an unusual and, and new and weird thing my god they give that to you in spades on this and again to break with tradition this is a weird and unusual color as i've said lots of flaming lips records came in more colors than the rainbow although i will say I do not like this particular piece of art. I've never been particularly keen on, on, um, on graphic design that uh, is, seems gratuitously sexual. There's a time and a place for that stuff. And um, Great Six is, is something that's very intimate and you probably shouldn't be putting cartoons of it on your records. Um, hence why I disliked that particular Wasp record I mentioned the other day. The last release of this period um, on the 27th, um, not the 27th of October, but just before Christmas was uh, this. Imagine Peace by At Last Eats Christmas, which is apparently an imaginary album recorded by, I think, Imagine Peace in 1973, which the Flaming Lips uh, have managed to refound and delivered back to you. That's bullshit. It is a album. It's, it's the Flaming Lips Christmas album. The Flaming Lips perform on it. They pretend that they don't, but they do. They produce it. Um, and uh, according to this, there are only three people that perform on this record. Imagine Peace on piano. Uh, Ominog Banged on uh, Laughing, Crying and Glider Synthesizer. And Shiniyu Bupal on Drone, Sitar and Tambura. 
that's nonsense, isn't it? It really, really is. This is a Flaming Lips album um, because if someone was trying to put a Christmas album out with some random musicians on, uh, you can guarantee Warner Brothers and Bella Union would be like, who the fuck are you? And why do you want us to put this out? And no, you can't. You can do it yourself on a handmade CDR and a cardboard sleeve and sell it on Bandcamp and nobody would buy it. Uh, it isn't, is it? It's the Flaming Lips in, in all but name. Um, it has the uh, widely available for the first time ever on here. Uh, Imagine Peace was released as a, I think, a SoundCloud playlist in 2011 as part of the um, release a month period that where the band was sticking stuff out all the time, which obviously brought a Strobo trip and things like that, and then reconfigured for a physical album release. So I'm a I hate Christmas albums, not because I'm not a fan of Christmas, but because I don't, it's like people don't do Easter albums, do they? People don't do summer albums, they just do albums. So the idea of doing a Christmas album just seems a bit, bit rubbish to me. And this is, uh, I mean, it's quite good. Played it at Christmas, enjoyed it, quite fun. But again, absolutely not essential listening, not something you need to have in your collection. If you're a Flaming Lips completist, of course you need it, and you need it on red Christmas vinyl. Uh, maybe there's a rarer black black vinyl version of it. I have no idea. And in case any of you are wondering, I don't know if this is the original inner sleeve. Uh, I buy a lot of stuff secondhand. And uh, when you do that, you get to the point where you kind of go, maybe it isn't the original inner sleeve. Even if it is, it doesn't really matter. Because ultimately it's about the music and what the music does to you and whether it changes you and speaks to you and, and, and uh, transforms you and interests you and makes, you, makes things amazing for you. And if it doesn't, you probably shouldn't be listening to it, is, is pretty much kind of my, my approach to it. So that is uh, Flaming Lips, it's The Terror, it's Peace Sword, um, it's Seven Skies H3. It is all of these things, it's a really super prolific period. We have six studio albums uh, released by the Flaming Lips in their various configurations in this period. And not only that, um, we also have, of course, the, uh, the covers albums, um, which are super limited, the Tame Impala EP, which I don't have. And um, you have the, uh, well, I haven't mentioned it yet, but I will do um, the, uh, the, the, the other releases which occurred around that time. So uh, other stuff I will mention when I get to it, of course, includes, but is not limited to, uh, an album by Miley Cyrus and the Dead Pets, which I haven't mentioned uh, on the grounds that uh, I forgot and I ran out of time. And that came out in 2015 as well. So this is where I am going to, to wrap up. And thank you so much for spending all of this time listening to me monologue about a band that don't sell very many records. You know, the Terror got to number 21 in the US, it got to number 42 in the UK. They aren't a huge band. Uh, they're big enough to be able to be completely self-controlled and self-contained, and that is all that really needs to happen in a band. If you love the band, all you really want from them is for them to be able to carry on making records and not to split up because of the evils of money. And if that's, if that's the thing, then that is the thing, and that is a victory in itself. So, the terror. A really great period for the band. I really enjoy it. I'm really glad that this stuff exists. There's so much of it. I still feel like 10 years later, I'm just scratching the surface of all of this. To release effectively six albums in 18 months is staggering and I am just jealous because some people don't get to release six albums in their lives. I'm looking at you, Guns N' Roses. So, Take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful. Like and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Bye. Right. Now I better go and switch this off. So I need a third hand to come up here and do that. If you're still watching this, like Ferris Bueller, what are you doing? Go home. Film's over. Bye.